parts of the new space a surreal shape rises from the Florida plains looking like a huge grain silo with wings it's officially called a space transportation system to most people though it's known as America's space shuttle this is America's main space effort for the next decade the first reusable spacecraft. Each shuttle is planned to fly a hundred missions into space. If successful, it will begin a new era in space exploration. The shuttle's now undergoing final tests, and it's due for launching within the next few weeks. The project is three years behind schedule and four billion dollars over budget. Dubbed by some the Space Lemon, its troubles in the generally successful American space program have been unparalleled. But this project has pushed high technology to its limits. The heart of the space shuttle is the orbiter Columbia. In appearance, it looks like a stubby airplane. But there are notable differences, like the pods for three large rocket engines beneath the tail fin. Constructed primarily of aluminum, it's a kind of rocket plane. Its designers hope it will be able to shuttle into and out of space, the first scheduled space service. To do this requires special materials and construction. Silica fiber can withstand the tremendous temperatures encountered when traveling through the Earth's atmosphere. It's used to protect the aluminum skin of the orbiter. Compressed into blocks, the silica fiber is sliced into sheets. Then the critical process begins of cutting and shaping individual small tiles. 31,000 of them are needed to sheathe each orbiter. Each tile must be custom made for its spot on the craft and the measurements must be exact. The silica tile is finally sprayed with a ceramic coating. The coating is baked onto the tile in a small oven. The tiles are then ready for attaching to the skin of the orbiter. The gap between each tile must be no more than 17 hundredths of an inch. At every stage of the process, workers wear white gloves to prevent the sweat on their hands from corroding tile surfaces. The tiles on the undersurfaces of the orbiter will absorb searing heat as it returns through the Earth's atmosphere. If one tile should come off, program scientists concede, there could be a zipper effect. This could strip Columbia of its insulation and incinerate its two-man crew. Early tests showed that this could happen all too easily, turning the smooth white surface of Columbia into a ragged patchwork. It will be the Space Shuttle Columbia that makes the first trip into orbit around the Earth. The 122-foot-long spaceship, which looks like and lands like an airplane, is being molded into existence. Development problems were also encountered with the orbiter's engines. Unlike previous spacecraft, they're designed for reuse. They must be able to complete 55 missions before being overhauled. These are the smaller maneuvering engines used for re-entry. The main engines help provide thrust at liftoff. They must fire at full thrust for eight and a half minutes, using half a ton of fuel every second. to produce up to 470,000 pounds of thrust, resulting a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. Problems in testing the shuttle engines continue to cause delays. To get the shuttle off the launch pad, the main thrust will come from the two crayon-shaped booster rockets. Once ignited, they cannot be turned off. The boosters burn a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen, producing nearly 500,000 pounds of thrust. In contrast, tiny retro rockets fitted to the orbiter are for delicate maneuvering in space. They're designed to be fired in very short bursts. The final element of the space shuttle is the huge external fuel tank. It's 154 feet long. Attached to the underside of the shuttle, it feeds the three main engines. A remarkable sight during the testing program. These pictures of the orbiter mounted on top of a jumbo jet led many to believe mistakenly that this was how it was to be launched into space. But it was purely to test how the orbiter would glide to Earth after re-entering the atmosphere. 
Previous American spacecraft had splashed down in the sea. Future space travelers can expect to come down on dry land. Orbiter, booster rockets, and fuel tank were pieced together at the Kennedy Space Center, Florida. Seabirds circled the giant vehicle assembly building as the complete shuttle was rolled out. The builders are determined that 1981 will be the year of the space shuttle. Although President Reagan has cut back on most areas of government expenditure, the shuttle program has been given the green light. But the risks are high. Even the first flight has to be manned. This is a very proud Despite the me. development problems, there's and no shortage of volunteers. Major events that occurred Women are among the astronauts and scientists on the program, the as are blacks. The 35 completed a 12 -month it's hoped program, that through the next decade, scientists will be shuttling in and out of space. They'll do so in the front the section of the orbiter. On the top level, the astronauts will pilot the vehicle like a conventional aircraft. Behind the cockpit are the controls for handling payloads in space. Almost everything's computer controlled. In operational use, there will be room for four astronauts on the flight deck. Flights will last for seven days, and when they're not at the controls, astronauts will live in the deck below. Here, there are storage lockers containing clothing, equipment, and food. There's more space on this orbiter than on any previous American craft. In orbit, it's meant to operate like an all-purpose freight truck and passenger bus. In one corner, the waste management facilities, space jargon for the toilet. The shuttle has to cater for seven people in orbit. No other spacecraft has carried more than three. But facilities are good enough for astronauts and scientists alike to operate in a more normal environment than on any previous space flights. The controls for oxygen and water are located under hatches on the lowest level. The sophistication of the orbiter controls contrasts sharply with rather primitive escape techniques. These practice escape routines are for failure on the launch pad. There is no way the crew can be rescued from space if anything goes wrong to prevent the orbiter's return. The crew for the first flight is co-pilot Robert Crippen, a Navy captain, and a commander who already has four space trips to his credit, John Young. He explains the shuttle's first mission. We're talking about uh, the first launch, uh, 54 and a half hours from uh, liftoff to touchdown. Uh, the first revolution uh, will, ha will have a couple of uh, maneuvers in it to get it into good orbit, into 150 mile circular orbit. We're talking about staying up there. Four 36 revolutions, uh, deorbit occurs uh, over the Indian Ocean, over the South Indian Ocean, and uh, landing occurs at Edwards Air Force Base in California. For the astronauts on the mission and the American space program, the launch of the shuttle is just as important as the moonshot. It's more than five years since the Americans launched a manned space flight. As commander of Apollo 16, John Young was walking on the moon in April 1972 when the American Congress approved funding for the space shuttle program. The importance of the shuttle is shown in one of its typical missions. Two minutes after launch, the solid rocket boosters, which provide the main thrust, burn out and are jettisoned. They fall into the Atlantic on parachutes to be recovered, refueled, and used again. The shuttle continues climbing on the thrust of its three main engines. Eight and a half minutes from launch, these engines shut off and the external tank is detached. This is the only part not reused. The shuttle's final boost into orbit is provided by two smaller engines in the tail, the orbital maneuvering system, fed from onboard fuel tanks. While in space, the craft is positioned by the use of 46 small jets set in the tail and the nose. 
The orbiter's speed now steadies at five miles a second, and the operational tasks of the shuttle begin. Co-pilot Robert Crippen explains. That point is to get the large payload bay doors opened up. The reason that we need to do that is the insides of the doors are configured with radiators, and uh, that is how on orbit we primarily cool the vehicle. Uh, prior to that time, we're having to use flash evaporators, which uh, just uses water that we have stored on board, evaporating it uh, to cool the electronics. And with the doors open, we can go ahead and conserve that water. Satellites and other cargo can now be launched into space with the use of television cameras and a remote-controlled lifting arm. About 20 percent of the shuttle's payload capacity is reserved for military use, including the launch of spy satellites. The Russians have just developed a killer satellite and are reportedly working frantically on their own version of a shuttle. Weighing five tons and measuring One civilian scientific project will be the launching of a giant space, space telescope. Work is progressing on grinding the 94-inch primary mirror. The completed telescope will weigh five tons and measure 43 feet long by 14 feet in diameter. It will give astronomers long dreamed of views of space. No longer will they be obstructed by the veil of the Earth's atmosphere. The shuttle will be able to place the telescope in orbit at a height of 310 miles. The new telescope observatory is scheduled to be placed in orbit by the space shuttle in the 1980s and will circle the Earth at an altitude of 310 miles. Mission accomplished. And with these space missions completed, the doors must be closed before the orbiter can return to Earth. This is a major concern of the space engineers. They are worried that in orbit the vehicle might distort and the doors might not fit back into place. The crew would then have to close them manually. Descent is achieved by slowing the craft using the maneuvering rockets as brakes. The shuttle then starts to fall from the vacuum of space into the Earth's atmosphere. Heat is generated through friction and surface temperatures reach 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit. This is dissipated through the heat shield of silica tiles. During the final phase, the shuttle is unpowered. Its delta wings enable it to glide, somewhat ungracefully, in a manner described as the controlled descent of a brick. The crew's task is to get it down onto a three-mile-long dry lake bed. After all the teething troubles, it's vital that Columbia's first flight succeeds. A serious failure now could endanger the very existence of NASA, the civilian space agency. But it wouldn't be the end of the shuttle. The shuttle program would probably be taken over by the U.S. military for the simple reason that beyond any purely scientific value, manned flight in space is considered essential to America's military needs.